we want to welcome you as well to this worship service this morning. Today, the, the theme of this worship service, as I am going through the lectionary, Wendy and I are going through the lectionary together, though we are one week behind a little bit. But this week has to do with debts and forgiveness. And I think the title that I gave this is Forgive Us Our Debts, something like that. And it's the importance of one of knowing that you need to be forgiven, but also your willingness to forgive others. There we go, we're, we're back again. <laughs> um, but the reasons why we come together. I mean, it is, was a long journey where we couldn't be in the same place together. And it is so nice to have people in the same room that I am. Um, it's amazing how much eyes and a head nodding back and forth help. Um, in the sense of, it's always been, as, as I have ever preached anyway, that it's always been a two-way street. That I am being preached to as much as I may be preaching out. And if it doesn't work like that, then there's something wrong. Um, God speaks to us all. But the reasons why we come together is because we know we need each other. And we were reminded to meet each other with each other frequently. And so when two or three are gathered in the name of Jesus Christ, we can say together that this is the day that the Lord has made. And so we... Amen, amen. Let us take a moment now and prepare for worship. Let us pray. 
Gracious God, renew our minds with the power of the Holy Spirit. Cleanse our spirits with the mercy of your grace. Bring us into fellowship with one another and grant us courage to defend the lowly. Part the waters of our troubled thoughts that we might see others as you see them. Protect us with your powerful hand that we might sing of your faithfulness and dance to your glory. Amen. Amen. And now um, we will um, sing our home, Praise to the Lord the Almighty, hymn number 71, verses 1 and 4. As we have gone through the confession, both silently through ourselves and collectively as a congregation, sometimes we don't always hear that God has forgiven. 
And sometimes we don't always hear from others when they have forgiven us. But know this, my brothers and sisters, always, always, that in Christ, even as we confess our shortcomings, we have confidence, for we stand before God to whom we belong in life and in death, and whose mercy knows no limits. Praise to the Lord our God, who has forgiven us. Amen. And so now is a time when, again, we won't be asking you to stand up and to pass the peace of Christ to one another. But as Wendy helped us last week to do, as you can stand and look to each other, and you can pass the peace of Christ with the American Sign Language way of saying, Peace of Christ to you. Let us offer that peace of Christ now to one another. company of the faithful through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. So as we get ready to hear the scriptures this morning, there were two scripture lessons for this day. Well, there was actually more than that, but the two that I will be using is one that was when Moses was taking his people up out of Egypt. And as he got to the water that separated them, he, uh, he was scared. And yet God told him to go forward. And so he took his staff, as you know the story. And God parts the water. It is God's strength and God's power that separated those waters that allowed the Israelites to walk through into that next part of the journey, which we know would be the desert. And Wendy, as she preached last week, talked about once they got into the desert, there was this need for both water and food. And there wasn't any, and the people complained and said, why did you bring us out here into the desert to starve? If you had just allowed us to stay there in Egypt, at least we would have had enough food to eat. But God was trying to take his people to their kingdom, to their home. And he said, I will provide for you daily just enough. But walking through those waters, that had to have been a scary event. To see the water on either side of you separate. And then to take those first steps into that place of the unknown. That's a bit of where I want to take us today as we think about debts, as we think about sins, as we think about forgiveness, asking God to forgive us and forgiving each other is a bit like stepping into those waters. And I want you to know that God will be there. And also how it connects is it connects also, just as we know that we need water every day. 
and we need bread every day to sustain our bodies. And what Jesus will be introducing us to is this need for forgiveness every day and our command to forgive others as well, just like water. And so, I want to start with the Lord's Prayer, but I'm going to pray it from the way from my own heart, not just exactly as you might hear it. But listen to this. And so God, we call upon you. You are holy. You are our creator. You are the ground of our being. And we praise you. We ask God that you would give us our daily needs, our food to sustain our bodies, the water that we drink, the shelter over our bodies that keep us warm and the company within each other. And God, forgive us our debts, our trespasses, our sin. As we forgive those who are indebted to us, to those who trespass on us, to those who sin against us, help us to forgive. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from the evil one. For yours is the kingdom and the power, and the glory forever. Amen. What Jesus has been teaching about, and this is from chapter 18, he's been teaching the disciples, he's been teaching those who were there about what they needed to expect as they got into the kingdom of God. Not talking about a kingdom that happens just when we die, but a kingdom that was at hand and needed to be started to be lived out now. Someone much wiser than me said, if you want to die well, then you need to live well. That it is through our living that we find how to die well. That idea that the kingdom of God is right there. You need to practice this now. And so he tells them to come as children. To be that simple-minded, in a sense, of that willingness to trust, to step out into faith. And then he starts teaching them about how to live through problems with each other. Because he knew that there would be problems with each other. He, he knew that. And as they would be gathering together as a body of people, which he then starts to call the church, those that are following in the way, of Jesus Christ. And he says, when you have a problem with somebody, don't go out and tell everybody else first. First go and talk to that person that you have a problem with and see if you can work it out. And if they won't listen to you, then take two or three more with you and maybe they can help you to see if you can work out this problem that you see. And if they still refuse to listen, then bring them before the whole church. But first, try to work it out, you with the other one. And we know how hard that is to do. When we feel like someone has offended us or walked on us, we want to go and talk to other people. We want to do something about it. Or we want to just avoid it and hope it'll all blow over. Right? And especially in the church. <laughs> Sometimes we expect the church to be that place where everybody loves each other or else we've had enough experience, which I think we all have had, <laughs> is that if it wasn't for all the people, the church would be a great place to be. Sometimes we say that. <laughs> but that's not the church. The church is us together, walking through life together. And then Jesus starts to talk about something even more important in the sense of it has to do with forgiveness. 
And so reading from chapter 18 of Matthew verses 21 starting with 21 and then going through 35. And then Peter came and said to him, that is Jesus, Lord, if another member of the church sins against me, how often should I forgive? Seven times? Jesus said to him, not seven times, but I tell you, 70 times seven, which is an infinite number of times. It is you keep doing it. You keep doing it. For this reason, the kingdom of heaven may be compared to a king who wished to settle accounts with his slaves. So now he's going into a parable. When he began the reckoning, one who owed him 10,000 talents was brought to him. And as he could not pay, he could not reckon that, he could not pay it all back. His Lord ordered him to be sold together with his wife and his children and all of his possessions and payment to be made. Because the Lord of the land had that authority and that ability. And we're talking about somebody who wasn't just a slave. This person was a servant of the Lord. And so he had authority as well. He probably had other people under him, which we will read about, and he does. And what he owes the Lord is probably a hundred lifetimes of money, an unfathomable sum, and of course he couldn't pay it back. So he's going to go to jail. And so the servant, he falls on his knees before him saying, have patience with me and I will pay you everything. And out of pity for him, the Lord of that slave, that servant released him and forgave him the debt. That's a kind of a reconciliation. It is taking the books and drawing a line through it at that point saying they balanced. There's nothing out of balance here. It is zeroed out. You don't owe a thing. Can you feel that place? Have you ever been in debt knowing your credit cards are so high and that every year, especially when we go back into the 80s and the 90s when interest rates sometimes on credit cards were 17, 24 percent. And you go, how am I ever going to get out of this? And yet if you don't use your credit card again for just that week's food, how will you survive? Maybe you remember those times when you were young. Maybe you can feel them now. But for a banker or for a creditor to say, you know what, we're just going to zero out this account. When I was about 21, 22 years old, I had gotten into an accident and um, it was my fault, though I didn't feel like it was all my fault. I surely didn't mean to hit the car and it was a miraculous thing that nobody was killed. My car, I stopped at an intersection and I pulled out, and this is in Fairbanks at about 40 below zero. My car slides through into the other lane. As a car was coming at me, he just glanced off my van, which is one of those old vans that had no front nose. And he glances off my van and he goes into the woods and his car is totaled, my car is totaled. I'm taken to court. And for some reason I had no insurance. So I get my license suspended because you're supposed to have your insurance. Life was tough in that year. So I was held liable. I had to pay that off. And about that same time, I was newly going to a church. And in that church, there was a guy who was a loan um, Actually, his job, he had come from New Jersey, and his job had been in New Jersey, one of those mob kind of people who made sure that people paid back their loans that they had taken from the godfather, I guess. But anyway, then he had a legitimate pe uh, job, and he was kind of helped people to get their way out of debt. And he was a person of deep faith, and he offered to help me to get out of debt. And we worked out a plan and I wrote letters and I was able to slowly pay off all that I owed to that person for their car, for their injuries. And I worked my way out. But that person used his faith 
and his love to help me to see a way through all of that because it seemed impossible. I tell you that story because I know each of you has your own stories of that places where you have owed a great debt and you weren't sure how you were ever going to get out of it and you could feel the weight and you ask for mercy and the mercy is given to you. But that same slave, as he went out, came upon one of his fellow servants who owed him a hundred denarii. And seizing him by the throat, he said, pay what you owe. And then his fellow slave fell down and he pleaded with him, have patience with me and I will pay you. But he refused. And then he went and he threw him into prison until he would pay the debt off. And when his fellow slaves saw what had happened, they were greatly distressed. And they went and they reported to their Lord all that had taken place. And then his Lord summoned him and said to him, You wicked slave, I forgave you all the debt because you pleaded with me. Should you have not had mercy on your fellow slave as I had had mercy on you? We all could answer, yeah, he had mercy on him. Why wouldn't this fellow have mercy on his other people? Has it, was it because he just forgot what mercy was like? Or had he just not been changed even though he had been forgiven. See, what Jesus is getting at is that if we know that we have been forgiven our sins, and our greatest sin is to always, we sin against God and we sin against neighbor. We've always had this constant battle within us, right? I want it my way. But my parents want it this way my brothers and sisters, my people at school, wherever, and as we grow up, as is beginning to see that we have to compromise our needs. Freud used to call that the ego and the, the id being the basic I need, I want. And the ego be going, ah, I'm aware that there are other people that have needs, but that super ego says that the other's welfare is just as important as my welfare, and I'm willing to sacrifice my needs for the other. That was the super ego. But we use it in our terms of this part of, I have been forgiven. It's not just about me, but it's about the whole world and how to live with each other. And it's not just about debts, though that is a big part of our world. Predatory lending, I think you all know what that is. And you see them on, especially like on uh, around military bases, you'll see where you can borrow against your paycheck or you get that and then you can get some hard cash real quick and you can go out and spend it. They're willing to loan the soldiers uh, the money for a car at a, at, you know, they will give you a loan even if your credit was bad. And then you can't pay it off. And then they get their money, they get the car, and then they sell it to somebody else. And sometimes these cars, if you follow them out, they've been bought and sold 20, 30 times. They just keep taking advantage of one more person to the next. Until these people have to either go bankrupt to see if they can get it zeroed out. But you can only do that every seven years, right? This part of how people get trapped into it and how hard it is to get out of it. When you are poor, it is so hard. And the only way you feel like you can get out of it is if you can buy something. But that buying gets you in deeper in debt. I met a one young woman once in Fairbanks who um, couldn't get out of that cycle of debt. And she was a dancer at a prostitute and she lived in a trailer that was connected to this place that gave her lodging as long as she kept dancing. And she had to keep dancing to pay off what she had owed from the previous month and the previous month. And it was a cycle that was never going to get broken. When Wendy and I were in Bangladesh, we saw the same kind of things. 
There's a place where if you're scratching your head about systematic racism, it has a place in this. Whether you are Hispanic or you are African American or you live in what we may call, you know, the, the slums of a town, you're on the wrong side of the tracks. It is really hard to ever get out of that place. It's one of those places of why we have public education because in, when you get an education it can help you to understand the world around you. That can give you the opportunities to start to say, I am somebody. I am worth something. I can learn how to get out. But the other place where you see that, and if you can remember that educational system was started by the churches. It wasn't started by the government. It was by people in the church that said, we need to help out this situation where poverty is. And education was one of those ways. It was people reaching out to each other that were willing to give loans to those who couldn't really prove that they could make it, but they had a dream. It was people who were willing to forgive what they owe and to help out each other. That's one piece of this. But it's also connected to that real basic place of forgiving each other. To be forgiven when you have caused some injury, some harm, and you've recognized it and you ask the other, will you please forgive me? And if you'll give them a moment to wrestle with it, and they may first say, no way. <laughs> That's it. That's the last straw. I can't take it anymore. But you plead with them, will you please forgive me? And that's where Peter says, I can do that seven times, maybe. Jesus says, maybe that's not enough. If the other is still willing. I mean, this is hard stuff. What does it mean to forgive somebody that has wronged you? How far do you keep trusting them? How much do you keep, you know, giving them a little bit of room to move? Where you hold them fully accountable and you close them out of your life. You have to wrestle with that. I have to wrestle with that. The scripture, what Jesus is talking about, is deep and it is hard. But I do know that Jesus really hits us hard with forgiving, with loving, with helping each other to get out of this cycle. And then continuing with verse 34. And in anger his Lord handed him over and he was tortured until he would pay his entire debt. So my heavenly Father will also do to every one of you if you do not forgive your brother or your sister from your heart. See, it wasn't just forgiving with money. It was forgiving with something even far deeper. It's your heart. What do you treasure? And that is where your heart is. That's what Jesus says, what you treasure, that is where your heart is. Henry Nouwen, who was a uh, theologian, pastor to pastors, he says it like this about forgiveness. He says, forgiveness is the name of love practiced among people who love poorly. <laughs> the hard truth is that all people all people love poorly. We need to forgive and to be forgiven every day, every hour, increasingly. And that is the great work of love among the fellowship of the, not the strong, but the fellowship of the weak. That is the human family. It is hard. It is hard to continue to forgive. It is hard to ask for forgiveness, right? Sometimes it's easy to ask God for forgiveness. It's another thing to ask forgiveness from your neighbors, from your loved ones. And it's another thing to give forgiveness. It is deep and wide, but that is a part of our faith. That is at the core when Jesus taught us that Lord's Prayer. Every time you pray that, that is what you are praying. 
Forgive us our sins as we forgive those who sin against us. Whether you use debt or trespasses, they're all in the same boat. And God does forgive, right? And we need to assure each other. We are here this Sunday to be reminded of that. That God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son. God trusted us even though he knew that Jesus was going to be killed. And then gave us a second chance. And we live in that second chance. We are Easter people living in the realization that we, our order of life is that the kingdom of God is all about us and that not only do we live by daily bread each and every day from the love of God, but we live in that realm of forgiveness. Amen and amen. There is an affirmation of faith that I have in the bulletin. And I will read it out loud and you can read it in your own breath, in your own way. The life, death, and the resurrection and the promised coming of Jesus Christ has set the pattern for the church's mission. His human life involves the church in the common life of all people. His service to men and women commits the church to work for every form of well-being. His suffering makes the church sensitive to all human suffering so that it sees the face of Christ in the faces of persons in every kind of need. Amen. Let us sing our... Our song called I Then Shall Live in the green hymnal on 372. Again, just remain sitting and sing quietly to yourself. And Lyle, you would lead us in this hymn. I was not familiar with the words of that hymn, but we all know the tune pretty well. But as I saw the words of that hymn, I said, I think that's the hymn that we need to sing this day. Announcements. Um, 
Again, the announcements that we have, they're in the back of the, the bulletin. You'll see there that uh, Saturday breakfast continues every Saturday morning from 9.30 to 10.30. And we, not only is there breakfast, but there is also some food boxes to give away. And then worship will continue to go on. If you notice on September 29th, that will be Tuesday of next week, I believe. Not in two days, but in whatever that is, nine days. Um, the Red Cross will be here with their blood drive. And I don't, do they need help with the volunteers or this is for us to be able to come in and give blood? Barbara? It's both. both. So they could use some volunteers to help them, perhaps with the orange juice and the brownies or to have them have a seat. But I know that we'll be practicing our social distancing and I know the Red Cross is very good with that. So again, be aware of that on the 29th. And then on the 4th, we will have communion. And your elders, your, your session has come up a way for doing communion. And Lyle, do you want to speak to that at all? Um, no, well, just so we have these little... You can take the mask off if you want, probably. These uh, little um, self-contained communion um, cups. So we will be passing those out as you come in. And hopefully you don't spill the juice on your lap while you're listening to the sermon before, uh, before we uh, have communion. But uh, it's a pretty nice setup where it's all self-contained and we'll be passing out uh, um, a little a box with uh, two or one or two in it, depending on how many in your family. So. When, when it gets to be communion, you'll get to see what somebody's come up to right. um, have it as much uh, touch-free as possible. Right. I want to talk to you about the Peace and Global Witness, and we found several different brochures, so I don't know whether you got this one or not, but it's a, an offering that we take the, between now and the 1st of October, and it is um, to uh, help out uh, the peacemaking, um, we get a portion that we will be able to distribute here in the community as well as offerings in the region and then national. And I suspect that at least in the region, some of it's going to be going to fire response because that's a witness that the Presbyterian Church can do to our community that's really aware of what's going on. Um, so just want to make you aware of that. The other announcement that I'm excited to announce is that starting tomorrow, we are going to be starting to replace the siding on the west side of the building. And we, have the, we did the south end last year, so this year we're going to do the west end, which is the second most critical part of preserving our building. So if you drive by them, you'll get to see uh, the men out there working. And uh, so, Thank you that we are going to be able to make that happen. Yes. And I'd say one of the things that made that happen, not only through the generous donations that you have been giving throughout the years that have helped us to build up this account that allows us to do the continued important work um, of maintaining this building, but that it was also through the work of the wider church, the Presbyterian, our Presbytery, which comprises all of Oregon for the most part, and that through that we were received a $10,000 grant to help us to replace the siding. And that Barnabas grant has, the reason why that is given to churches is because there have been churches that have closed and when they sell the property um, that money goes into this pool which is then spread throughout the denomination and the Presbytery saw the importance of us being able to keep up the good work of this uh, keeping things going and we owe a lot of thanks to Charlie who keeps working on keeping this church maintained and Robbie who keeps it cleaned and all of the work that goes on. Um, I also want to, another announcement is an opportunity for you, as you know, the fires in, in Lincoln County and in more precisely up 
in Lincoln City, though Lincoln City itself, the proper part of Lincoln City, did not get hit much. Just a bit of it at the northern end of the Devil's Lake. The majority of the houses that were burned out were from Otis and Rose Lodge. About a hundred structures burned. The Red Cross is there working with people. Um, the, uh, the, the county fairgrounds in Newport is a place where things can be donated, such items like furniture or things like that, and then that is also given out to people. But there's also another group that was started, and I'm trying to recall the exact name of it, but um, it's a group that is working in conjunction with the county and it is working out of what was the store was called the loft up there at the outlet malls and what they are doing is is they're giving out gift cards to families to people and these gift cards go directly to them and then they keep accounting of, of all of those gift cards that go out so the session up at Chapel by the Sea has establishing a fire relief fund. And through that fund, they are then giving money to this organization that works with the county to get those gift cards. But it is also, we're working with our Head Start program because many of the children that are in Head Start lived in the Otis area. And if any of you know Lincoln City, the Otis area is where a lot of the working poor live. And it was their homes that were taken out. And there is a housing shortage in Lincoln County, and it is very hard. So that's one way you can give. You can also give through the presbytery um, to specific churches and places. So especially down in the Medford area, those homes that were lost. We understand that 3,000 people have been displaced. And again, they also had only like a 1% opening for housing. So. Um, your gifts in any of those directions, you can earmark them as you give to the church here and it will go into the right place. But I'm just letting you know those are a couple opportunities for you to give. Don't think there are any other announcements that need to be made. And so as we begin to go into a time of prayer, I want to, again, I put in my hearing aids today. I didn't have them last Sunday, but now I can hear better. But it, uh, if you could let me know of your prayer concerns that you have. Yes, Scott? I just want to mention on those, uh, with regards to the announcements, uh, uh, the uh, TC Global Witness Offer is uh, going for, through from uh, today through October 4th. Okay, so right, so again, and that offering goes, um, if it's, it goes to a lot of ways of working for peace, but I think one of the ways, isn't it, that we see it through working with children as well? Yes. Okay, and I think it has gone to our literacy program in the past, and it's gone to other places. So I think we get to keep a percentage of that offering here locally. 25%. 25%, great. And, uh, another 25% goes to the, our local region, mm -hmm. and then uh, 50% uh, goes to the uh, global uh, effort in a lot of other countries that, that have problems, such as Bosnia. And, and yes. And Great. Thank you, Scott. Um, and so as we go into a time of prayer, a prayer that was, that was shared with me this morning is that there has been a group of moms that has been praying for the school children in our local schools. And, and that a little program of moms has started praying as the school would start up in the season. Now this program has spread to 100, I think 104. 140 countries. 140 countries where this Sunday, is a day in which it's been set aside for praying, especially for the school children as they start school back up. And we know that they need it. Bless the school Sunday. Bless the school Sunday. Thank you, Joyce, for raising that prayer concern. Other prayer concerns this morning? Yes. Some of you know that our son, Karen, has a big department in state. The roofer did not seal off the drain, it's a flat roof. Oh, oh no. <laughs> he walked into the parlor to change his brain, and the rain came again, so it kept coming. 
coming. So not only is this pizza parlor shut down, <laughs> there is no money coming in. <laughs> and uh, several people out of work too because of that. So definitely, I, I guess I pray for that pizza parlor because it's been around for enough years that and that is in Staten, that is in Staten, if I remember right. And Carrie owns that pizza parlor, and the pizza parlor was in the midst of getting a new roof on when the fires broke out, and so they didn't get a chance to seal the roof off, and so the flat roof flooded the pizza parlor with about three inches of rain. So all the tile is coming up, all the sheet rock is coming through, like water. It's going to be and that pizza parlor keeps people employed. It is a place for people to gather. We will absolutely keep your son Carrie in our prayers. Thank you for sharing that, Jan. Thank you, thank you so much for the prayers for Brandy and little Chloe. Chloe arrived safe and sound. So thankful for that. For Chloe, okay. Other prayers this morning. Let us take these prayers. And I'm going to start off with a prayer that was written by uh, Marian Tirabasi. God, across the fires of Oregon, of California, of Washington, Colorado, weep down your blessing. Comfort those who grieve and those who have loved family, friends, neighbors, from the oldest to an unborn child. Wrap your sense of home around all who have lost house, land, work, places where food has grown and beauty was found. Send faces of compassion, masked faces, who understand people's doubled fear of evacuation in a time of pandemic. Sustain those who rescue and respond. Those who fight fires, give breath in the smoke, escape for creatures, and hope in tomorrow. May there be rain from the clouds and a rain of kindness among all. And so God, we, as we have prayed for rain, we also know that rain comes down. And when it comes, it oftentimes can go into places where we don't want it to. And so we lift up Carrie and the pizza parlor and all those who have worked there and those who are waiting to go back to work, those who are hungry for that kind of food and can't wait to be back together. We pray for Carrie as he manages this pizza parlor and makes tough and hard decisions. God, we ask that your grace would be with him and that you would give him the strength that he needs to do the work that is before him. We thank you for the prayers answered for Chloe. God, we pray for so many who come to our minds. I pray for my friend Steve, whose mother passed away this last week. We pray for all those who have lost homes, who need shelter. We pray for all the firefighters and first responders who need a break and fresh air and a good shower. We pray for those who are evacuating at this very moment. God, we pray in the Spirit. And so, Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayers. We pray for the church far and near, for this church, for those who will be working on the siding and putting it on, for the church leaders as they make hard decisions, for each one of those who this church has given shelter to, who gives breakfast out and food boxes. We pray for those who come and find shelter in this place. But we pray for all the churches the churches here and in Walport and in this county. We pray for all of the churches throughout this nation and abroad. And so, Lord, in your mercy, we pray for the earth. And in these times when it feels like the earth is just absolutely falling apart, whether it is a hurricane or an earthquake, a volcano, fires, floods, 
God, we ask that you would give us the strength and the courage to help us not make the matters worse, but help to, con to take care of this world of ours so that not only we, but for generations to come, can find this place as a home. Give us the strength to endure the changes that will come as we know the climate is warming up. God, there are so many things to keep in mind as we pray for the earth. And so, Lord, in your mercy, we pray for all nations, for all the nations that they would find ways of peace in the midst of war. We pray for our nation. We pray now for our leaders, for the family of Ruth Bader Ginsburg, as she has passed away, but has given such service to our country. We know that those men and women who fill those shoes take on a responsibility that is huge and big. We ask God that you would give them strength and that you would be with our country as it makes hard and tough decisions and that God you would take us away from drawing the lines in the sand between each other and see each other as brothers and sisters trying to figure out the best way to live with each other. And so, Lord, in your mercy, we pray for this community, for all the many ways it reaches out. We thank you. And so, Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayers. And together we pray the prayer that our Lord taught us, saying, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our sins as we forgive those who sin against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. And so now is a time when we can give back to God. God has given to us abundant life. We are not going to be passing the offering plate around. There is an offering plate in the back, but you can also mail in your offering. You can also do it online. But it's not just offerings of mine. It's offering of your time, of your talent, of your love to one another. And so take this time now to think about how you might give.
so I send you out from this place, out into the world, out with this charge, to go out into the world knowing that you have been forgiven, that your debt has been paid. And so go out into the world and forgive others and do that hard work of forgiving through God's love and take this blessing with you that you would know that you are a child of God and that God loves you so very much and know that you have been forgiven. May you have the eyes to see that you are a child of God and that the kingdom of God is at hand. In the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit, know that God has blessed you. Amen.